in which he analyzes the consequences of the erasure of the names of traditional authors and objects from modern Urdu letters and poetry, Inzar Hussain notes the commonality between the uh, reformers and the clergy in the second half of the 19th century in this regard. Noting that traditional Urdu poetry came in for attack by Maulana Altaf Hussain Ali under the names of Mill, Milton, and Macaulay. These were constant references, right, for these people who couldn't even really read English at the time, but um, th this was, these were the most important authors, a kind of benchmark for, you know, this, this, uh, you had to be as good as Mill, Milton, and Macaulay in order to create literature uh, at all. It's a, um, I, I should think it's quite the opposite of that. Right? Mill, Milton, and Macaulay, he points out that Hali's contemporaries, Sayyid Ahmad Khan and Dipti Nazir Ahmad, these are very important figures in the modern his, in the development of modern Indo-Muslim historical consciousness, referred to the Prophet Muhammad as Muhammad Sahib, Mr. Muhammad. So I call him Mr. Muhammad, right? And Paghambar Sahib, Mr. Prophet. Right? The next generation of reformers, the progressive writers who brought back with them from England, he says, quote, English wives, law degrees, and some new techniques in literature, close quote, also brought authority to such names as Gorky and Maupassant, right? This is the, in the 1920s, 1930s especially. On the other hand, among the Malvis, so the clergy, the authorizing names, so this, is very, this is very important, right? So it's not just the progressives, people like myself, right, who are to blame for this or who are subject to this or vulnerable to this. It's the clergy itself. And how? So the clergy, on the other hand, among the Malvis, the authorizing names were Gibbon and Carlyle, right, both of whom had relatively positive things to say about the Prophet Muhammad. So that immediately does away with this idea that what we are talking about is um, anything like what we otherwise think of this clash between tradition and modernity. Because here, the Malvis themselves are completely indebted to Gibbon and Carlyle. Gibbon and Carlyle both have positive things to say about Muhammad, so we should look to them, right? In truth, he says, the mental development of, of Malvis and literati has proceeded along the same line. Close quote. What Intizar Hussain is gesturing at here is the fact that in the post-colonial context, neither the progressives nor the so-called conservatives, so-called conservatives, they're not conserving anything in fact, have actually kept faith with the past. Such a keeping faith with the past may be the most minimal acts of resistance with lit little effect on the all but ineluctable course of modern history, even as it is a rare ethical act, opening up possibilities of community and insight below present levels of discursivity and visibility as I shall further elaborate below. I don't know if I will be able to do that. <laughs> we, may call this, we may call this level either that of tradition, which the word he uses is revaya. Right? There is a passes by word of mouth. An important term in Inzar Hussain's critical lexicon, or all but synonymously, we may call it the Indo-Muslim. Inzar Hussain's beloved Hind Islami Tazib, so the Indo-Muslim civilization. Inzar Hussain brings out the minimal nature of this ethical relation to the past in another avow. Open quote, in insisting on the past, the writer of fiction does not, or at least should not, mean to suggest that bygone days should be brought back. When have bygone days ever come back? What has been lost cannot be repossessed, but at least its memory can be preserved. Close quote. There are two related betrayals involved in thinking that the past can be brought back the betrayal of the present, which can only appear in its own catastrophic clarity right, and specificity against an irretrievable past. Those of you who know the you know, famous image, Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, um, the new angel of history, which Benjamin interprets, will recognize it's only if you are aware of how much destruction has actually taken place, right? Can you see the present in clarity? In, terms of itself. It's, it's against the background, right, of disaster that what the present is appears, right? So this, this is the kind of very strange way of looking that he has. The betrayal of the present, which can only appear in its own catastrophic clarity and specificity against an irretrievable past, and perhaps even more importantly, the betrayal of the past, whose claim and integrity can only appear when it is seen in the spectral light of its death. You don't, know what you, you don't know what you've lost until you lose it. 
In Zahr Hussein's attitude here, which I would suggest effectively inherits the ethos of the Ghazal, right? um, the preeminent genre of Urdu lyric, specifically with the trope of keeping faith with the beloved in indefinite or permanent hijr or firaq, separation. You know, I often think it's, we simply don't, as, Mus as Muslims, we don't think enough about how significant it is that our calendar, right, is the hijri calendar. It's the calendar of exile, essentially. Hijr in Arabic, right, of course, is uh, migration, right? This is how we usually think of it, right? This is now, today, the most common way of thinking of it. But Hijr also means separation. It's an absolutely essential trope in practically all Muslim poetry, right, is this idea of separation. So when we say whatever, I don't know, know I don't even know what the Islamic year is this uh, right now, 1400 what? Sorry, 1434. So 1434 years of exile, right? This is essentially what the connotations of this would mean. But to get back to a more specific historical context, uh, inherits the ethos of the ghazal, the preeminent genre of Urdu lyric, specifically with the trope of keeping faith with the beloved in indefinite or permanent hijr or firaq, separation, is analogous to the recent ethical turn I think, you know, there's, there's uh, a good reason why a lot of recent schools in Western philosophy are harkening back to these experiences after all the disappointments. The recent ethical turn in deconstruction, which affirms that melancholy is the only affective posture that can maintain fidelity to those losses that the reigning ideological formation would like to disavow. Not just the reigning ideological formation, but the entire thrust of modern society and there is little to differentiate here between the state and the public sphere, with its emphasis on progress and action, militates against such a melancholic posture. Is a melancholy, this is for losers, right? I mean, there's a, being depressed, I mean, it's, there's a whole clinical vocabulary around this. Nobody uses the word melancholy anymore, right? Um, so we use depression, the disease, not unlike nostalgia, which is also a disease, right? So. So th this is from the point of view of the losers of history. So, so he's a loser, right? So he says, um, with its emphasis on progress and action, militates against such a melancholic posture. In Pakistan, as in other post-colonial contexts, where the rhetoric and imperative of development and progress asphyxiate discursive space even more aggressively, such a melancholic attitude is both rare and increasingly anachronistic. Put in a different way, Inzar Hussain's writing practice seeks to answer the historical narrative of both the state and the dominant culture of the public sphere by writing in a minor or nostalgic key, insisting ever so courteously, he's extraordinary, not a, he's not, um, he's much older than me, so he's not quite as much of a barbarian as myself, but he's extremely courteous, right? Very, very courteous and, you know, his irony is very, very light and wouldn't offend anybody. On answering the big yes, with a small no, right? To get a sense of the minority of this register, it is useful to contrast it with what was to become the Pakistani nationalist narrative of Indo-Muslim history. This narrative may be said to have come into its own with the writing of Sheikh Ikramullah's landmark trilogy, the first volume of which was published in 1937, the last in 1950. So 10 years before partition and then three years after partition of Indo-Muslim history, now available in a cheap edition of the Iqbal Society of Pakistan, right? So it's very widely disseminated. The first volume of this trilogy, covering the historical period from the first Muslim conquest in Sindh, although strangely enough, the book begins with a brief res reference to Adam's mythic past, um, arrival in Sri Lanka after his exp expulsion from paradise to just before the Mughal period is called Abe Kosar, the water of Kosar, this um, uh, this mythic body of water in paradise. The second volume covers the Mughal period and is called Rude Kosa, the torrent of Kosa, and the trilogy finally culminates in Moja Kosa, ranging over the period 1800 to 1947, the crest of Kosa. The trilogy thus conceives of Indo-Muslim history as developing like a powerful body of water in movement towards the telos, the end, the goal of Pakistani nationalism. In the standard nationalist text then, the Indo-Muslim, well, strictly speaking, there's nothing Indic about this, right? There's nothing, um, you can't really call it the Indo-Muslim because it's the 
it, it's the Islamic acting on the Indian landscape. So it's not Indo-Muslim at all. This is the difference with Intar Hussain is always in the process of self-realization towards statehood and beyond. More contemporary with Intar Hussain's writing career and after the creation of Pakistan is, for instance, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, his prime minister during the 70s, remarkable and telling statement from the floor of the National Assembly in 1966. This is worth listening to. Horrifying. He says, quote, Pakistan is not just a man-made country. It is a God-made country. It is a beautiful thought. Pakistan is the creation of the surge of Islamic nationhood. Pakistan is the product of an earth-shaking idea. So you literally have the sense of like a geological event, right? Um, in stark contrast to this, for Insar Hussain, the Indo-Muslim is always on the verge of vanishing. Right? The object of nostalgia, the name of lost community, creativity, dignity, possibilities. The counterfactual, counterfactual and apparatic logics of nostalgia are also suggested by the fact that the central myth in which Insar Hussain found a contingent justification for Pakistan soon after its creation was that of Hijra, right? the forced migration of the first Muslim community from Mecca to Medina that enabled not just its survival, but political sovereignty and the institutionalization of virtue. This is very troubling. Um, ben has already signaled to me that I'm running out of time. Um, and there's no way that I can get through the material that I had intended. I took too many um, apocues. Ap so I'm afraid the a lot of it was readings, is readings from the literature. So these readings can't really be summed up. But I think you have enough of a sense. Right? So we're talking about a very different sense. Uh, a lot of people do talk about hijrat, and they've created this whole idea of you know, migration from um, a heathen landscape. I mean, this is, this is uh, a trope, of course, in all of the Abrahamic religions, right? So the exit, starting with the Exodus, so the Hijrat from Mecca to Medina, migration, right, from a heathen landscape into whatever you want to call it, in Pakistan's case, land of the pure, right? So in 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 the Pakistani nationalist world, Hijrat would then also be exactly like this, right? That you gone from a heathen landscape, the heathen landscape of India into the realization of the land of the pure. That's literally what Pakistan means for those who don't know. But for, and it bears thinking about, both in terms of the larger narrative of hijra in Islam, as well as particularly in terms of Pakistan, that hijra is also exile. It is also separation, right? The separation from the beloved even. So for Intazar Hussain, that is much more as time has passed over the course of um, Pakistan's history, it has come more and more to mean precisely this much more ambiguous sense of hijrah, right? the sense of an exile from the beloved. Anyway, I'll stop there so, and take your questions. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Up to you. Uh, thanks for your paper. I was wondering, um, in this... Mm-hmm. 